friendship that'll never ever end. Run! It's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. Reaction being the yo 558. Day in the neighborhood, my brothers and sisters. As we proceed to give you what you need, we are going back to Jose Ortiz from Evil Intentions. Back to you with intentions, y'all. And this is one of the most strangest titles that I can remember from Jose. And the title of it is 30 Days of Suffering for Disrespecting God. Fingers Left to Mummify. The story of Taviel Kegis. Now, 30 days of suffering for disrespecting God. Like, disrespecting God in what type of way? You know what I'm saying, man? And then fingers left to mummify. Like, what that? I mean, I get what it means, but what does it really mean? You know what I'm saying? I don't know, y'all. I, I got some things that I want to say, but they sound so terrible. And I'm not sure that that's what uh, this story is really going to... The details of this story is going to be about. So I'm not even going to say them right now, man. We just going to check it out. And we going to see. But before we see my brothers and sisters, y'all know what y'all got to do. Get whatever you may need. Get what you need, please. We back to Jose Ortiz from Evil Intentions. Y'all got what y'all need. Y'all ready to go? Then let's in go. Before we get into today's story, I'd just like to take a moment to discuss some of the details that you'll be hearing today. Now, I know you guys are used to me coming on here and giving a warning before each video, but I also know that there are a lot of new people to the channel. So they might not know exactly what to expect when they watch one of these. It's just something that I've seen in the comments. And I want to make sure that people do take the warning seriously. Because trust me, I understand uh, the details are a bit much most of the time. I'd also like to take a moment to say thank you to the families who have been reaching out to me recently. Letting me know that they'd like me to cover some of these stories. It's something I truly appreciate. Thank you for thinking of me. And um, I will always handle these stories with the utmost respect. Some of the clips you'll see in today's video might look a little familiar if you've been on this channel before. And I put them there because I needed people to see how much the same thing continues to happen over and over and over again, especially when it comes to children. With that being said, I do have to warn that today's video does have a lot of details concerning mental and physical abuse that will be very hard for a lot of people to make it through. So please, before jumping in, viewer discretion is strongly advised. And I get what Jose saying too, man. I just got to speak on what he was just saying at the beginning real quick, y'all. I get what he's saying because a lot of people, especially like new people that don't really know his channel and it just pop up on their YouTube and you watch or hear these stories. This is some dark ish that he be telling. And then a lot of them be about children that hit you even harder. You know what I'm saying? Hit most of us even harder. And it'd be a lot of graphic ish up in here. So let me give y'all a warning too. Even though I know a lot of y'all pretty much know about jose but um for y'all that don't this is this is this is some rough stuff that we're about to listen to so if you're ready then let's go you could have been avoided the city and everything should have somebody in there watching those kids why when they hear the kids crying why right away they didn't call the cops let them come and stop this before this happened to her now Inside the church, the closed casket of six-year-old Elisa Izquierdo, 
hundreds of mourners and a priest who asked for the mourners' compassion and understanding for Elisa's mother, Awilda Lopez. I don't know what demons occupy this defendant or did or the kind of pain that she must have suffered in the past to bring her to uh, what I consider rage. Others say the system also failed Lopez. The thousands of mothers like Awilda that are not getting the counsel, they're not getting the, the care, they, it, it involves too much money. I think that these people could have did something, I'm sorry to say, if you call BCW many a times and BCW didn't come, what about going to get a cop? What about going to, to call somebody? They would have came in. Here's a difficult story to fathom. A New York mother is charged with starving her four-year-old daughter to death. Carla Lockwood reportedly admitted to the murder because she neither loved nor wanted the child. Lockwood told authorities she had not fed the little girl in a year. Oh my! Covered her face and had nothing to say leaving court after watching her daughter Cynthia Arce plead not guilty to murder. Silverzano discovered the violence in her Mamaroneck home April 28th. According to a handwritten police report attached to the autopsy papers, Solorzano returned home and saw the toddler in bed, quote, surrounded by stuffed toys. Arce had cut herself and was in a bloody bathtub. In court, she wore a turtleneck, but it didn't cover the scars where she slashed her neck. At one point, the defense attorney said he thought psychological testing would delay the start of the trial for many months. Over the decades, we've all heard and seen the reports of people who commit unthinkable crimes, and mental yeah. illness is often viewed as the reason for it. It's a huge factor in a lot of cases, from the most high-profile stories to the ones that were quickly forgotten. Tragedies like these often leave those in the community scarred for years to come. Some end up feeling like they wish they could have done more to help, while others act as if they had no idea anything was ever wrong to begin with. In November of 1993, residents of Bangor, Maine were readying themselves for the Thanksgiving holiday, just about a week and a half away. This would normally be that time of the year when families have loved ones in their homes and many are reconnecting, enjoying food and festivities. But that year, the holiday would be a lot different from those prior, because while many would try to mask their grief with smiles and laughs, in the back of their minds was the young girl whose face they just couldn't get out of their heads, an innocent child whose last days were cruel and unfathomable. And worst of all, every single day that this baby suffered went completely undetected by neighbors and an entire neighborhood. But was that really the case? After the horrors unfolded, Everybody in the neighborhood would know this child's name, but as often is the case, it would be far too late to save her life. Damn. On today's episode of Evil Intentions, this is The Girl in the Window, the story of Taviel Kigas. And I just got to speak on the, um, the, the, the thing about these parents that end up murdering their kids it, because they are mentally ill. And I'm, I'm not even putting it. I'm sorry for even putting that in quotation marks, y'all. Like, seriously, because I, I'll say some of them be playing crazy, acting like they men, mentally ill. But I will agree. I do believe there are people. Everybody should agree on this. There are some people who are mentally sick in the head. Like, seriously. And they need help. I agree with all that 100%. But as y'all know, if for y'all that know me being team, I feel like regardless if you're mentally ill in the head or not, if you do the crime, you need to do the time. Long story, short story long. Like, I don't feel like that makes it an excuse for what you did. You killed your kid. You know what I'm saying? Regardless, you got to face those consequences. Just that's just the thing for me. This is going to be a heavy one, y'all. Let's go. His crimes in which someone in the throes of mental illness kills. Taviel was starved to death. She, too, served time at the mental institution. Taviel Kigas was born on March 23rd of 1988 in Maine.
She was born to a woman named Tania Kegis, 28 years old. They resided at 55 Moosehead Boulevard in Bangor, Maine. If you find yourself traveling to or through Bangor, you'll have a wide variety of options when it comes to things to keep you busy. The area offers everything from local family-owned shops to different restaurants to a good selection of breweries and even offers lodging if you're looking to stay the night and plan more sightseeing. You might find yourself visiting the 31-foot-high Paul Bunyan statue on Main Street since Bangor is just one of the places he was said to have been born. His birth certificate even sits on display at Bangor City Hall. Wow. Maine is also home to famed writer Stephen King. He was born two hours away in Portland, but references to Bangor are all over his films, from the Paul Bunyan statue mentioned, to Mount Hope Cemetery, to the sewer drain that inspired that classic scene in the movie It. You can also visit Roland F. Perry City Forest, also known as Bangor City Forest, which has over 17 miles and 680 acres of different trails. The large area is filled with different wildlife and beautiful scenic views. This was where Taviel called home. She was described by those who met her as a pleasant, giggly, and a chatty five-year-old, a child who loved talking to people she just met and having conversations with her mother, an active and intelligent child who always seemed to be happy. She sometimes went by the nickname Tavi. While Maine was home to them, Tania Kegis, her mother, was originally from the South, traveling from Bamberg, South Carolina, somewhere with a much smaller population of under 4,000 people in 1993, versus Bangor, which had a population of over 34,000 people. The move made sense given her connection to Maine, because back on July 16th of 1986, Kegis became married to Taviel's father, and he was from Bangor. So, she made the move here because it seemed like a good place to raise a child and have a thriving relationship. But things wouldn't go exactly as planned once the relocation was complete. Over the years, living in this new neighborhood wasn't the easiest thing, because Tanaya didn't really know anybody and she didn't have family here. But as time went on, neighbors would try their best to make her feel at home. People who lived by Kegis and her daughter would begin to build a friendship with her, inviting her out, opening their home to her, and trying as best as they could to involve her in plans. One neighbor stated that when she was still living near them, she and Kegis became so close that they were practically like sisters, confiding in one another whenever possible. It was said that while Kegis came to Bangor for Taviel's father, he never lived at their home with them. He was mm. never really seen much, and some took notice of that. It was stated that he abandoned her and their child. The family of her husband lived nearby, but she wasn't close to them. Despite becoming close to one or two people, she wasn't a part of any social circles in the neighborhood, and she didn't have any real support from loved ones. Okay, and I'm not making any excuses for uh, Tanaya, but she is like out there on her own. And the one thing I was wondering, y'all, the one thing I was thinking about just hearing Jose uh, talk about the very first part about getting to know Tanaya is the like in uh Taviel, you know what I'm saying? Like how involved is the father? And come to find out, the freaking father just left them, just left them. Long story short, story long. And now Tanaya, she literally has nobody else. All her family is in South Carolina. She don't know nobody, even though the neighbors are trying to reach out to her. But I'm just saying, man, just kind of put yourself in that mind frame of what she was. Well, she the only reason she moved here was because of him she'd had this child with him and now it's just her and the child i feel like that's what she should be like you know what i'm going back to south carolina with to, um with uh taviel man we going back to south carolina long story short story long on that but like i said i ain't trying to make no excuses for what she end up doing because just from the title it is crazy over time the very few who had gotten to know Tanaya Kegis would notice a sudden change in her. She was acting very different, very withdrawn, and when they did interact with her, it was very bizarre, but they had no idea how much worse this would all become. As time went on, Kegis and her daughter were seen less and less. Some recall seeing them travel on the city bus and running errands around the area from time to time, but that was pretty much it. It was apparent that she had no interest in maintaining friendships with these people. What made it obvious was a situation that unfolded in the spring of 1992. This was when Kegis was over at a next door neighbor's home, talking with her neighbor and her neighbor's boyfriend. The conversation was normal at first, 
But then, out of nowhere, Kegis would start to accuse the woman and her boyfriend of being Satan worshippers. It was a strange and very random accusation. It created a tension between them, so understandably, the neighbor felt that the best thing for everyone was if Kegis went home. The neighbor placed her hand on Kiga's shoulder, asking her politely to leave the home. This is when, without warning, Kegis, holding a set of keys between her fingers, punched her neighbor in the face, opening up her forehead, causing her to bleed. The situation escalated very quickly, and the police were called. At first, she was going to be charged with assault, but the case was quickly dismissed by the district attorney after being investigated because he believed that Kegis' neighbor was the one who instigated the fight. After this, the neighbors didn't hear anything else about that case. Before all of this, the couple would see Kegis and Taviel all the time, and they were all on good terms. The sudden change in personality and her behavior was out of the blue, for them at least. Her actions would begin to trickle down to Taviel, who was just a child who wanted to make friends and be a kid. Unfortunately, that would never happen. Due to the violent interaction Kegis had with her neighbors, both parties were summoned to the offices of the Bangor Housing Authority to address what took place. According to those neighbors, at the end of that meeting, both them and Kegis were threatened with eviction if there were any more complaints made. It seemed they just wanted no part of whatever was going on, but that wouldn't be the last time that police were called to the location. In the winter of 1992, months after the incident in her neighbor's home, those same neighbors would make a call to 911, stating that Taviel was left home alone and her mother was nowhere to be found. They thought twice about even making that phone call out of fear of being evicted, but after about 15 minutes, they called authorities. They knew she was home alone because they had seen her in the window, and Kegis wasn't there. They had seen her leave some time before this. It struck them as wrong to leave a five-year-old all alone when anything yeah. could happen. The yeah. officers who arrived and took the report stated that they would be reporting this to child welfare services, but for whatever reason, that couldn't be confirmed. The neighbors felt that it was possibly just disregarded. As tensions grew, it came to a point where these neighbors wanted no trouble, but they were often taunted by Kegis, as if she wanted them to try and call 911 again, since she knew that they could possibly be facing eviction and would likely think twice, which they did. As time okay, this is some evil lowdown ish. If uh Tanaya using her daughter to try to elf with them, knowing that if they keep having these uh, I wouldn't even call it confrontations. I would call it interactions because all they doing is reporting that you leaving your damn child home by herself at five years old. And am I the only one, y'all? I gotta say this too. Am I the only one that feel like? Uh, the police showing up and seeing a little five year old there by herself, and y'all you, not gonna do nothing about that. You know what I'm saying? All y'all said was, "Uh, we gonna report it to DHS." Oh uh, no, man, we need to do something with Tanaya. Maybe we need to get this child out the house. At the very least, we need to stay here until she come back or something. I don't know, man. Maybe I'm tripping on that part. But it seems like Tanaya is using her little child to. I don't even know the word to the, her neighbors. And she already was off a rocker from the beginning with these neighbors when she just out of the blue called them devil worshipers. And that's where the whole snowball got uh, the rolling. And now it's getting bigger and bigger. And went on, this happened more and more. Kegis isolated herself and her daughter from others. It only got worse. There were no more conversations. And Taviel was no longer allowed to play with any of the kids in the neighborhood. Neighbors tried inviting them to birthday parties for their children, but to no avail. Some felt she was just very overprotective of her child, since she once mentioned the other kids playing too rough. But no matter how many attempts were made to build a friendship or any type of trust, it did no good. Neighbors barely saw them around anymore, something that felt very off from the day it began. It was also clear that Taviel wouldn't be allowed to interact with them or the kids, and it didn't look like it was changing anytime soon. Kegis refused to talk to anyone and refused help with different things. For example, when she was offered a free washing machine and help with mowing her lawn, she didn't want the help. On top of that, Kegis and her husband would get divorced. Like any separation or breakup, this was a harsh blow, and it seemed like it only added to everything already going on. 
things with her became progressively worse. The same neighbors that she had that incident with back in 1992 noticed how much her anger and frustration was being taken out of her daughter. They described one time, just one, where they witnessed a mother and daughter outside playing with a frisbee. But after one or two tosses, Kegis would yell at Taviel to get back inside because she was annoyed by her not knowing how to throw a frisbee correctly. Instead of being allowed out with the other kids, she was locked in her bedroom. All Taviel could do from here was look out of the window, waving at the other children as they passed by. Even then, she tried to keep a smile on her face. She would hold up her doll from the window and greet the neighbors and their kids, trying to have some sort of interaction with the outside world, mouthing out words from her bedroom, trying to have conversations. The kids waved back, confused as to why she wasn't out there with them, why they were seeing her locked inside her room more and more. Pretty soon, they would become used to seeing her that way. She never went to the park, never went swimming on those sweltering summer days. She was just indoors all the time. The lonely child who seemed to now be a prisoner in her own home. It was Man, Jose making this shit horrible and sad as fuck, y'all, man. Just the thought of this little girl being locked up by her mama. And I just feel like, man, her mama was being so abusive to her behind those closed doors. And when I say abusive... Now, I'm not even just talking physical. I'm talking like mental, you know what I'm saying? Emotionally abusive, like just the way she because you got a little glimpse of it when they was playing Frisbee out in public. But imagine how she talked to this her little daughter, five year old behind closed doors. Like even a parent, the words that a parent can say to a little child, man, is just as it, it probably ain't just as abusive as physically harming them but it's still elf the elf up man and just the fact that she had to resort to waving to the little kids as they passed by because her mama wouldn't never, never let her outside and ain't no telling what else the mama was doing to her which we about to find out more and more about it's just like this little girl was Oh man, I did. It, 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 you know what this do, y'all? Seriously, stuff like this just make me just thank God that I got the mama I got because it could have been a lot worse. I could have Tanaya could have been my mama. You know what I'm saying? Do you feel that? It was like a dark cloud that hovered over everyone who lived here. Many knew exactly how things had changed and the effect it was having on this five year old. They would learn just how horrific things had become for little Tavi. In September of 1993, Taviel was on her way to kindergarten at Down East School at 100 Moosehead Boulevard, just down the road. Here were many kids who lived nearby that she would be able to learn with and get to know. While in school, to teachers and to counselors, things seemed normal. No signs anything was wrong. Taviel was her happy and chatty self, according to them, and the other kids in her class liked her. But that wouldn't last very long. Because just a month later, in early October of 1993, Tanaya Kegis placed a call to her school and told them Taviel would no longer be attending kindergarten there because she had the flu and she would be moving her to Miami. She was immediately pulled out of class. What those other kids and teachers didn't know was that Tavi was on her way to suffering a truly cruel fate. As soon as she was pulled out, the child who many were used to seeing in good spirits in the past was now receiving constant beatings and always being punished. This was because Kegis believed that her daughter was possessed by the devil. Oh A perfectly my God. normal five-year-old was now seen as evil for no reason at all. Oh my God, man. My brothers and sisters, man. We went from Tanaya tripping out on her neighbors saying that they possessed by demons for no reason at all to now you saying your child is and you constantly be like, man, see, this is what I'm saying. Tanaya is mentally ill. She is, man. She is crazy as a mother, you know what, in the head. But. Her ass still need to face all the consequences that come to her. And even, I'm not even talking about just on earth, even in the afterlife. And I believe in one. And people like this, they, I just pray, man, they get what the fuck they deserve. Jesus Christ. Over the next month, from early October, when she was taken out of class, to mid-November of 1993, Taviel was again back in her room. 
only able to look out of the window to try and see a friendly face or two. Except this time, after the beatings, her mother decided that she would just stop feeding her. No food, no water, and no care in the world. For over 30 days, she was locked in that bedroom and never given a meal, being ignored as if she didn't even exist. While the other kids in her class were learning about Thanksgiving and getting ready to have feasts with their families in a few weeks, Taviel had nothing, nothing but her thoughts, her hunger, and her suffering. At just the tender age of five, she had no idea why she was being treated this way. On November 8th of 1993, after a month of having not a single thing to eat, Taviel began to scream at the top of her lungs in desperation, in need of help. It was said that she had access to just water from a bathroom for a short while, but not the entire month that she was being neglected. But she had no energy since she wasn't eating. She would become so weak that she couldn't even make her way to the bathroom anymore. By this point, Tabby would have been suffering from the effects of severe dehydration and starvation, the fatigue, confusion, weakness, drastic weight loss, dizziness, chills, and even depression. Her screams were likely due to what she was feeling and possibly seeing as her life faded away. Whenever her so-called mother heard those screams, she would pop her head into Taviel's bedroom and tell her she was going to die, unless she showed some respect. And then she would put on some loud music to mask her screams. She went about her business, carrying on with daily routines as if her daughter was the last thing on her mind. That loud music and Taviel's screams would go on for days, and supposedly, neighbors didn't hear any of it. On Friday, November 12th of 1993, at around 11 a.m., Taviel's screams were no more. The music was turned off, and the home was now eerily quiet. After slipping into a coma when her screams stopped, her heart would stop beating. Taviel was gone. After more than 30 days of being neglected, beaten, and starved, her suffering had finally come to an end. Throughout all... Oh my God, man. Jesus Christ, man. Those were some of the most graphic details I ever heard from a Jose Ortiz story, y'all. Man, listen. She was five... I don't even... She was five years old, y'all. Can you imagine your mama? Man, I don't even want to go. Y'all heard it, man. I'm not even finna go back through all that, man. Jesus Christ. And I got to say this, too. I got to say this, and I, I know some of y'all may not understand what I'm saying, but maybe if I give you the details of what I'm trying to say, you will. It may sound effed up when I first said, but you're going to get what I'm saying, man. It got to the point where hearing that she had passed away almost was like a relief. You know what I'm saying? Not even just for me, just for her too, because she was suffering so freaking bad at this point. 30 days, and I said I know I wasn't going to go to the details, but the fuck that. 30 days without food, without water, locked up in a room. She got a little water every now and then from a freaking the bathroom sink. This girl was getting treated so badly till it was like, it, it was at a point where it was like, I'm glad God called her home and got her away from this terrible five years old, y'all. Man, this one right here, I just got a serious headache. Rest in peace, baby girl. Uh, I, 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 like I, I was talking about earlier too, y'all, I believe in the afterlife. And I believe, and not believe, I hope on this part. I just hope. Tavia, wherever you at, I just hope it's way better than what the fuck you had to go through on earth because of your fucking, I'm not going to even put all those words out there, but y'all know how I feel about the mama. Let's go. I, I got so many emotions right now. I'm mad. I'm sad. I'm head hurting. Just all type of ish right now. Just five years old, man. All of this, there was no communication with others. Neighbors would begin to see Keegan's mail stack up since she either wasn't around to pick it up or just didn't care to. Except for one light being turned on at some point in the month of November, there were no signs that anyone was home. They also noticed that for a while now, 
They hadn't seen Tabby looking out of her window. It was as if she just disappeared, almost without a trace. Of course, what they didn't know was that from October to November, there was someone home, a starving child, who was just slowly dying in her room, all alone. And if her mother was home, she just ignored her, letting her suffer. Even after her daughter was gone, Kegis went about her days as if all was well. On Sunday, November 14th, just two days after Taviel died, Tanaya Kegis took a cab from a variety store not far from her home over to the airport mall. This was said to be around 6 p.m. While here, she would stop at another store at the mall to cash a check, and then took that same cab back to the front of her home. She was seen by a neighbor exiting the cab and walking into her house, but they noticed that Taviel wasn't with her. These neighbors had no idea that the child had already died of starvation. It would be on November 15th of 1993, three days after her daughter died, that Kegis would pick up the phone and dial 911. The dispatcher asked her what her emergency was, and she would reply that she was calling to report that her daughter was dead, and she wanted to know what to do with the body. Authorities what? would arrive at 55 Moosehead Boulevard a short while later, finding Taviel's small, malnourished body lying in the middle of the bedroom floor. She was found fully dressed, wearing a hat with socks on her feet and on her hands. Her face was covered with a piece of cloth done by Kegis so she wouldn't have to see her face when she walked in and out of the room in the days after. Her body was emaciated with the lack of water causing the tips of her toes and fingers to become partially mummified. Around 4.30 p.m. that same day, neighbors watched as her small body was carried out of her home in a body bag. Tanaya Kegis was arrested and taken in for questioning, and what they learned during that interrogation would make matters even worse, if you could believe it. The interview lasted two hours, and here she detailed what took place. She confessed right away to purposely starving her daughter. She also said she didn't care what happened to her daughter after. She stated that everyone always spoke about how beautiful and bright Tavi was, and the way she said it, it was almost as if she was jealous of her own daughter. She said the following, I made up my mind I wasn't going to feed her. I didn't murder her. I just let her die naturally. Tavi became evil. The more I did out of love for her, the more she hated me. She manipulated me, stabbed me in the back, and hated me because I wasn't a white woman. Okay, this lady is officially fucking stupid now. God damn it, I hate to say it, but god damn fuck this shit. At mentally ill, y'all get mad at me if y'all y'all want to, because I'm mad now. This lady goddamn said... <sighs> she said... That her child was manipulate, uh, her five year old daughter was manipulating her, stabbed her in, in the back, and is and hated her because she wasn't a white woman. Does any of that statement make sense coming from a five year old to her mother, the one woman in the world that she look up to more than anything? I'm sorry, y'all. I'm sorry, man. Maybe, maybe I'm wrong for calling her stupid because she do got mentally health issues like I have established. Maybe that came out of a little fit of rage. Excuse me if you offended, man. But Jesus effing, I mean, come on, man. This I did not expect all these emotions coming out of me from this video. Let's go. You see a very different child at school than I see at home. She would go on to describe how small Taviel had become and how she cleaned her body and covered her eyes after she died because they were bulging out. She would then begin mimicking the sounds the child made as she fought for her life. It sounded like she was fighting it, like she was possessed, like she was fighting God. I told her she was going to die and why, and she told me she didn't want to die, but never asked God to forgive her. She had suffered so much since she was conceived, and I knew she had to suffer one last time. She would then turn up the radio as loud as possible so she couldn't hear a thing. She showed no emotion as she spoke about it. It seemed as if she was satisfied with this outcome, knowing her daughter suffered, not caring at all. When she was asked if she had told anybody about her plot to starve her daughter, her response was, no way. 
She was then charged with the murder of Taviel and taken to the county jail straight away. On Thursday, November 18th of 1993, a service was held for Tavi at the Fairview Cemetery in VZ, Maine. More than 100 people, most of whom never met her, showed up to pay respects for the innocent child, who in life wasn't even allowed to speak to anyone. All lookers surrounded the small white casket where her body was placed. Five pink balloons, one for every year she lived, were attached to her casket. Everything from stuffed animals to long stem roses to bouquets of flowers were left on top. The five balloons were given to five people who looked on while the reverend said the following, God's love does not end when you and I walk away from this grave. Tavi is in God's hands. She is at peace. Taviel Kegas shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Let her go. The balloons were then released into the sky. In the days following Taviel's shocking death, neighbors expressed their grief, saying they would be forever haunted by the visions of the young girl that they would always see in the window. Many found themselves trying to cope with the loss, feeling like they knew deep inside that something like this was going to happen one day. One neighbor was quoted as saying, Every day, we have to look at that window. It's hard to eat, and it's hard to sleep. Others would say that she led a short and awful life, indicating that people knew what she was going through, on some level, at least. While Taviel didn't have many friends, the news was very hard on the children who went to her school. They couldn't quite understand the concept of what was done to her, but they said her name often. One child was quoted as saying, here we are talking about Thanksgiving and having big meals, and this girl's mommy wouldn't feed her anything. It was clear that the cruel nature of the crime took its toll on the entire community. It would spark many opinions on how to handle a situation like this. Many felt that neighbors were tight-lipped and made a choice to not say anything about what they might have heard. Others felt like it was too late to start feeling bad. If they could have said something, they should have. It was odd that nobody called or complained while music was blasting for two or three days straight. The principal at the Down East School stated that when this was happening, she went to the home, looking through windows and knocking on the door to see what was going on. She got no response. It's unknown if she visited when the child was already deceased, but she did try. While many battled with the guilt and grief of what took place right next door, this was about Tavi. And now, nothing could bring her back. On Friday, December 10th of 1993, during her arraignment, Tanaya Kegis pleaded not guilty by reason of insanity. Defense attorney stated that she was not criminally responsible for her daughter's death due to, quote, paranoid schizophrenia causing her to make decisions that weren't grounded in reality. She would be ordered to undergo further psychological evaluation to see if this was true, and she was sent to the Bangor Mental Health Institute while she awaited her fate. I hope to God that uh Jose say that she is found guilty. See, see, this is one thing that um and it go back to what I was saying. It it, it all ties in when I say this real quick, y'all. Like I said, I do believe that people are mentally ill, but I feel like they should still face the same consequences. Consequences regardless or not. That's why I feel like this whole plea not guilty because of what I can't even remember the correct technology, but they plead not guilty because of means of insanity. Long story, short story long, because I'm freaking crazy in the head. That's what they trying to say. That's why I'm not guilty. Motherfucker, you is guilty. You did it. I, I'm, I'm sorry, we gotta take this crazy stuff out And I, I keep harping on it I get it, y'all I know that there are mentally Let me say it like this And this is the best way that I'll make all the sense in the world on this Even if I was mentally ill in the head If there was something freaking wrong with me And I killed somebody Let alone my damn five-year-old child In the way that she did But it, let alone that If I kill somebody and I, I should still goddamn be locked up For the rest of my life At least that much I'm sorry man We can't make Like that don't make it no excuse I told y'all man A lot of emotion that came out of me on this one I even had a second where I had to wipe a freaking tear from my eye On this damn video Now I'm back bad What the Man let's go on Monday, June 12th of 1995, Tanaya Kegis was headed to trial to answer to her charges. 
The trial would be overseen by a superior court judge and not a jury. It would last a little over a week and experts were called to the stand to see if her mental state played a role in the sickening crime. During her trial, the two-hour videotaped interview was shown to the few allowed in the courtroom. When some of her relatives entered the courtroom, Kegis would wave and smile at them, still showing no emotion. Taviel's grandparents sobbed as they listened to the details straight from Kiga's mouth. While the defense would say that she wasn't responsible thanks to her mental state, the prosecution would say that while she may have had some mental issues, she knew exactly what she was doing. It was premeditated, and she should be held responsible for it. Throughout the trial, Kegis would deliver more bizarre statements, with the defense saying that she heard God's voice imitating her daughter and saying she heard her neighbors, the ones that she believed were devil worshippers, chanting that she was pregnant. She would state that Taviel died for disrespecting her and God. Kegis would also tell doctors that she believed the jazz musician Pat Metheny was God, and she was pregnant with his baby. She even wrote the musician multiple letters, though what was stated in those letters wasn't revealed. After a while, she said she believed he could read her thoughts, and was talking to her telepathically. She often heard voices in her head telling her these things. She also believed that while in jail, guards were trying to poison her food to take her life. When it came to her being pregnant by a jazz musician she's never even met, it was said that this was only touched on and not further explored, even if this could have been seen as a clear sign that she was insane. During testimony, it was revealed that she always suffered from mental illness, going as far back as eight years old, and it only seemed to worsen, reaching a peak in 1990 and onward. Neighbors also testified about their encounters with Kegis. In a surprising move, throughout her time at the Bangor Mental Health Institute, she was even allowed to visit Taviel's grave, since doctors thought it might help her. Due to testimony by the doctors and everything that was revealed, Tanaya Kegis would be found not guilty by reason of insanity and was remanded to the custody of the Bureau of Mental Health for as long as it would take for them to determine if she was no longer a threat to others or herself. Over the years, she would make several attempts to get leniency in her sentence, which they would eventually agree to, even allowing her to make decisions with her medication. She was given less supervision and was allowed to leave a supervised group home and instead move into an apartment where staff would be available to tend to- What the fuck, man? I'm trying to hold it together. What the fuck? Are y'all serious, Bean Team? Turn the goddamn volume down on this shit, man. Turn it down, Bean Team. Turn your volume down. What the fuck, man? See, this the shit I'm talking about right here. Right fucking here. I'm not going to go all the way back through the details and what all that this woman has. Man, these, this got, god damn, man. This story sound fake. It don't even sound real. Is this real life? I'm not going to go back through all the details of what she did to little Tavi. I'm not going to even go through that. Let's just talk about how I've been talking about the whole mental health thing. And how even though you might be crazy in the head. You still should face the consequences. You still should be locked up for the rest of your motherfucking life. And if you're not, I ain't going to say you got to be in 24-7 solitary confinement. But I'm saying you should never see the light of day again freely. This month, man, listen, man, she is out. Long story, short story long. Not only did they find her not guilty because of the insanity shit, which I feel is insane. You know what I'm saying? Not only did they find her not guilty, but she at her apartment, living in an apartment complex, probably pulling up at Walmart, eating McDonald's, going here. You know what I have, man? The world fucked up. The world is fucked up. To her, if needed, she was allowed to work for 15 to 20 hours a week. This would eventually lead to her seeking her release. And in May of 2014, she was freed from state custody. A scholarship fund was created in memory of Taviel 
in order to provide financial assistance to former, present, and all future students of Down East School where she attended. The funds raised would be used for summer camps and eventually even a playground. Several sources were tapped and many came together to make this happen. Even years after she was gone, it was clear that what happened to Tavi had a huge impact on the community and many had no intention on ever forgetting her. From the Bronx to Washington Heights to the Lower East Side, from Brooklyn to Long Island to Maine, you hear these details and it feels like you're hearing the same exact story being told over and over. It never gets any easier to hear. Sad to say, it seems these horror stories will never stop hitting the pages of our newspapers. It feels like there's no fix and no end in sight because it's still happening now. As hard as these stories are to hear, the discussion can't stop. If you ever witness or suspect that something like this is happening, please find a way, any way, to bring it to someone's attention. It can be a child suffering their very last moments, and a phone call just might be their only hope. If alive today, Tavi would be 36 years old. Wow. Rest in peace, Tavi Kigas. You aren't forgotten. Rest in peace to Tavi L. Kegis, man. 36 years old, what she would have been today, y'all. Man, first and foremost, great freaking job from you, Jose. Great freaking job from Jose Ortiz. And thank you, man. Thank you for bringing this story to us so we could never forget about Lil Tavi. I will never forget this goddamn story to the day that I die. I will forever remember her and always just say rest in peace to her, man. No matter how many freaking stories we have watched or watch in the future, my brothers and sisters. Because this is just in freaking sane from so many damn levels, y'all. Like, I, I don't even want to go through all the levels, man. I'm through with this shit, man. I am so... I did not expect me to get this emotional at all. Like, real talk, I got to go take me some Excedrin after I end this video with y'all, man. I got to take me some freaking uh painkillers around this bit. My head hurting from this shit, man. And I just didn't start cussing all... I'm cussing like a sailor now. You know what I'm saying? And I don't even be doing that like that, y'all. I just didn't went goddamn this shit, man. Fuck this shit. Hell no. Five year old, the, 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 the shit she went through. And then, then you put the bullshit on top, not the cherry on top, the bullshit on top. The damn lady Tanaya got back free. Working, she started working 20, 30 hours a week. And look what she did, man. What the fuck is wrong with the world, man? Like, is this shit real, y'all? Is this shit real, my brothers and sisters? I'm finna go and let y'all go. Cause I don't let y'all go now. All y'all gonna hear is another hundred goddamn sugar honey iced teas and F words and all that stuff come out of my mouth. I can't calm down. And I'm just gonna go and let y'all go, man. I know y'all feeling the same. Well, some of y'all at least feeling the same freaking way. Or at least y'all feeling how I'm feeling. What the fuck, man? Last but not least, before we uh even I stop talking about this one more time. Rest in peace to Taviel Kegis. But I digress. I'm going to go on Like I said, I'm going to let y'all go. And before y'all go, just please, 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 please hit that like button, comment, subscribe, and do all that if you ain't get that yet. And come on back tomorrow for another Coffee Man Friday. But until then, my friends, please, 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 please remember this. Love, peace, and happiness. Stay safe. Don't stop. Keep going. Yeah.